Hello, everybody. So, show of hands, who knows what differential privacy is? OK, that's the starting point. How many people have got data that's actually been processed in a differential private, differentially private way? Yeah, one. The, um, do people have Android phones or iPhones? Because they all use differential privacy. Just they don't tell you uh, unless you go and look. Um, so this is going to be a sort of potted history of differential privacy. Um, I've only got 30 minutes, so I can't cover the whole subject. Um, there was a much more comprehensive version of this given by Gordon Half at um, DevConf a couple of years ago, and I've got some links to those videos at the end. And you'll see on YouTube they've had 30 views. Um, so this is obviously one of the messages we've got to get across here. So the, the overall idea is what it says at the top. Preserving anonymity when you're collecting and using people's data. And that's, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> okay. So, when do you need to do this? You're gathering statistical data. That's the first thing. We're not gathering data about individuals, and we don't want to. We want to, but we do want to find something statistically. So we've got some questions that we can formulate in terms of statistics. Um, <clears throat> So you need to preserve the privacy of individual contributors and, in principle, be unable to identify them. And this is the key thing where the academic discipline comes in here. We can provide some very strong guarantees here. Um, it's mathematics, um, statistics. There's a framework which helps you to calculate the trade-off between accuracy of your data and the amount of detail you've got and the amount of privacy there is in there. So you have this constant trade-off. You can get absolute information about individuals um, breaching their privacy, or you can have some very generic information about lots of people, but maybe it hasn't got enough detail to be useful. And you've got to find a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. And this is a mathematics that covers this range from one end to the other, and helps you understand where you are on the range. And then you make choices in the way you frame your statistical questions to decide where you're going to be on that range, how much privacy you're going to allow, um, and how useful is the data going to be. Um, and so the specific examples where we're trying to apply this at the moment, um, telemetry, data, software usage. Um, so. I'm wearing Fedora shirt today. Um, Fedora, what do we know about our Fedora users? Well, we know that they do care about privacy. Um, but what do we know statistically about what software they're using, what packages, what features? And the answer is very little. It would be nice to gather some information from Fedora users who want to contribute. Um, and it would also be nice to gather that information in as private a way as possible. And so what we're proposing today is a framework that's able to achieve those objectives. And I'm going to go through a whole menu of different ways of doing it, different approaches different people have taken. Um, and it's a menu. You look at your problem, you look at all these possible ways of doing it, and then you choose what seems to fit best for what you're actually trying to do. You don't do everything that I'm going to show you at the same time. You pick and choose. Next slide. <clears throat> so I said it's a mathematical theory, academic work here. Um, it works independently of your TAC, of TAC models. So what this means is, when you're doing something with differential privacy, you don't have to consider the attacks. What, how can people try and breach it? You've got a general framework which covers all modes of attack. So you don't have to start worrying about individual types of attack. And this will make a bit more sense a couple of slides along. So it places an upper bound on the amount of information that's revealed to any attacker, regardless of whatever mechanism they might come up with. And that, that's why it's so powerful and why you know, all the big companies are using it. So some examples of existing usage. Um, the, one of the early ones that Apple used was emojis. 
it's really important to get the emojis in the right order. So the most popular emojis appear first on the list. So they gathered data from their iPhone users as to which emojis people were using. Um, but they did that in a differentially private way. So they did not know which user had selected which emojis. They were, in fact, only select getting a few random bits of information from each machine. But because the scale was so big, they could deduce what they needed to know from the aggregate. Um, and same, the same approach with domains causing Safari to crash. Same approach. The client does not actually send the domain over to Apple. They hash it. They do some maths on it. And then they, hand, they send one or two random bits from that. But because the scale is so big, when you add up all the bits that you've been sent, you can still make useful deductions about which domains are causing the problem. Similarly, Microsoft was one of the early uh, companies involved in all of uh, differential privacy. I'll come to that a bit later. Um, and they have a thing they've called smart noise. Um, and you can go to the smart noise website and read all about that. But there is actually a service where um, <clears throat> you can qu query a database via a differentially private mechanism. Um, and this is effectively a modifier on SQL. So it tracks how much privacy it gave you in the answers to your queries. And as you ask more and more precise queries, it starts adding more and more noise to the answers it gives you to disguise um, the data in there and make sure you can't track down an individual. Um, more examples at this link, if I get the right one. Here, yeah. So this is a um, this is another example here, and um, this this is a you know, Google one. Get that? Yes, here. Um, Gboard, Android. Next word prediction. So this is an example from AI, um, where you're running an AI model locally on a phone. You're modifying the weights in that model. You're then applying noise to the weights and sending them off to some aggregators which are combining all the weights with the noise from other machines, combining it all together, eventually it goes back to the global model, which gets pushed out to all the phones again. Um, and again, you see some more buzzwords in there, federated learning in there, and, and so forth. So this link, I say, the links are all in the, in the slide notes, so you'll be able to go to these later. But this is a page where someone called Ted has um, collected large numbers of examples where differential privacy has actually been used. Um, so we've got examples from Facebook, Google, um, and yeah, you, you can just, just scrolling through this, you can see Israel, LinkedIn, Microsoft, yeah, Microsoft telemetry collection in Windows, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The United States Census Bureau, the 2020 Census, um, Wikimedia, um, and lots more. So I recommend you go and just look at this page afterwards. Back to the slides. Yep. OK, so what are the mechanisms we might use for this? So the very starting point is you've got some data, and you need to make it private. Just remove all the identifiers that identify people from that data. That's the starting point. Um, De-identification. It has a lot of drawbacks. Um, and it's not very popular because you can't then do any statistics like divide, de dividing the data by age ranges because you've thrown all the ages away. You can't do you know, male, female. You can't do that. You've thrown those identifiers away. You're left with, with not much to work from. So then you get on to something that's known as k-anonymity. And this is saying, as I say here, all attributes that might identify an individual are present in the data for at least k individuals. So there's no unique data in there. That if, and if you find any unique data, you, make, you group it together so that it's not unique. So if you're going by ages, and you'd only got one person aged 24, 
but you'd someone aged 26, someone else aged 20, you might group them together and put everybody from 20 to 30, say, in one group, and then you've got an, a, a non-zero number in there. So you start grouping the data together so there aren't any identical entries in there. Um, but having done that, you've got to make sure that the actual data, the data data as opposed to the person-related data, is actually different in those rows. So it's all very well say, saying, yes, I've got my 20 to 30 people here, my 30 to 40 is here. But if every one of them has the value red in both those categories, you've lost. You can still deduce that somebody, every, anybody in the range 20 to 30 must be red. Um, so that's what they call L, L diversity. Um, let me go to this one. No, not that one. We'll find this eventually. I, I didn't have these in the right order. Here we are. So this is, in, this is the K anonymity example. Um, so you've got a data set here, which is K. That's two in this case, because the rows there, there are two identical rows. That row appears twice, and this row appears three times. So the minimum number there is two. So we call this, we put K is two in there. And then the example underneath here, you've got 1742 and 1743 here. So that one, it goes down K is one. Um, and then if we go, oh, L diversity is the next tab here. If we go to L diversity, so this shows the other problem. I've grouped everyone from 20 to 39 here, and they've got some particular diagnostic. Um, but the problem here is, um, you know, if, if you've got the zip, the zip codes, <coughs> the zip code here beginning with 47, um, if you know the zip code begins with um, 47, then you know that they have this diagnostic. Because the other ones there, the zip codes are 42, those are different. So even though we've separated out the 30 to, with 30 to 39 here, 20 to 39 there. Um, and so in, in this case, you have to go back and group them, take an even larger group, and put all the four zips. Anyway, I suggest you look at these references afterwards. There's an awful, there's an awful lot here. Um, let's go back to this one. Um, so those are the approaches, and every approach you you come up you can come up with a hack like that the k k anonymity the k anonymity the l diversity you come up with fixes to each of these problems, but every time you're just patching something on top, um, and when you take that to its limit, you end up with differential privacy. So differential privacy is basically the limit that you reach when you try pretty much any other approach at um, making things anonymous. You, they all converge on, on differential privacy. So differential privacy itself. Um, so one of the important things to realize is it's about the statistical procedure as well as the data. So it's not just the data. It's the data plus how you access it. And how you access it is an important part of this. Because what we're effectively doing is adding noise to the data when people query it. So it's data plus noise is what people get. And that noise is used to provide that level of privacy. And what we can do is vary the amount of noise, either a small amount or a large amount, depending on the circumstances we're in. Um, so that smart noise idea I mentioned from Microsoft, what they're doing is when you run your database query, they're varying the amount of noise based on all your history of previous queries and how much privacy those earlier queries have given up. And so the one of the formal definitions, you'll find various different ways of formulating it, but the one I've chosen here, um, you're running a statistical procedure over privacy-sensitive data. The output of the process would not change noticeably if any one individual's data was emitted from the data set. So the restriction is applied to the process, not the data. So in other words, if I've got a data set with 100 a, a people's data in it, 
and I take one person out, I've got a data set with 99 people in it now. If I run a query against the data set with 100 in and the data set with 99 in, even if I already know everything about those 99 people, I still can't work out which of the two data sets is the one with 100 in. If I ask the data set with 100, how many people are there in your data, data set, sometimes it'll tell me 99 because it's adding noise to it. And the one with 99 will sometimes tell me 100. So I can't trust the data perfectly. But because I'm doing everything statistically, I'm, I'm saying that the boundary of error is acceptable for the purpose I'm using it for. Um, so I've covered a few of these already, but just to list them again. So one of the examples is querying a central database. This is the Facebook advertisers example. Facebook has a big database of information about people which it wants to sell to advertisers, but it mustn't breach those individuals' privacy. So what it does is let the advertisers ask statistical questions about that data set. But if those questions are too specific, it might leak information. Therefore, it has to add noise, and it adds more noise to specific queries than it does to general queries. Um, that's the first one. You have a central database which you're querying. Um, the second example, you add noise locally. So this would be the telemetry example. When you're collecting data from people's devices, you add noise to the data before it leaves their device. Um, and then you aggregate that. Now, that's downgrading the level of data you're getting. It's making it less accurate. But the volume you're getting compensates for that. Um, and as I said earlier, there are examples where you are just running hashes locally and then taking random bits from the hash values. And that's all you're sending off. And yet, it's only a few bits of information from any machine, but it's still enough. Um, Another example is in AI models, where you've got some training data. Um, you don't want the training data to start appearing as the output of a model. Um, so you can randomize the training data before you do the training. And this differential privacy tells you how much noise you need to add to protect yourself uh, against the data leaking. Um, and you can take it even further and having done this, you can then create a model that generates training data with this for you to use randomly, but with the same characteristics as the data set you began with. So people even take that one further. Um, the, playing with the model, the weights in the model, that was the example of the Android phones sending data off. Um, and then you can also bring trusted third parties in here. So another approach is to say, well, I'll add a little bit of noise, but not that much. So there may be some breach of privacy, but I'll send the data off to a trusted third party who I trust not to reveal where the data came from or who sent what. And that trusted third party will do the aggregation for me and only publish the statistical data. Um, so they will run the queries for me. Um, so that's the third party approach. And then there's a two-level version of that, which I'll, I'll come to later on. Um, so what's, what is the noise? Random small ad adjustments that have a minimal impact on the statistics. It masks the data relating to specific individuals. And the most important thing, the average characteristics of the noise are known. So you've added noise with a known pattern to your data. So you can later subtract that noise out and see what the data is underneath. So you subtract it from the aggregate, leaving with the data. So here's an example of that. So now a really simple example, tossing a coin. OK, so let's say I've got some Linux distribution out there, and I've got some parameter in a configuration file, which is either a naught or a one. And I want to collect those noughts and ones and find out how many people have turned this feature on by changing that naught to a one. So I want to find what's the prevalence of ones as opposed to noughts out there. So I'm going to do this in a differentially private way. So this means I'm going to ask every user to toss a coin. It's either heads or tails. 
If it's heads, they're going to send me the real value of their data. But if it's tails, they're just going to pick a random number. So 50% of the data is going to be random. That random will be, again, half ones and half noughts. So if I've got 100 data items collected by this method, on average, 50 of them will be random. So I'll have 25 ones and 25 noughts, but 50 of them will be real. So I can take my 100 items, subtract 25 ones, subtract 25 noughts, and what's left is my distribution. But I've only collected that distribution from half of my individuals, but I don't know which half. Um, and if you then look, find out that a particular individual gave me a one, well, we don't know whether it's a real one or a random one. So it's deniable. That user can say, yeah, but it might have been an ought. You can't prove anything. All you know is, statistically, the likelihood of it being a one is the same as the likelihood of the distribution you've just gathered it from. So if three quarters of your distribution turns out to be ones, when you see a one from someone, you know, well, Three quarters, well, you, you, can, you can do the reverse uh, calculations, but you can, you can work that way. But you don't know anything about the individual beyond what you know of the aggregate. When I say add noise, so that, that, was, that was a really simple example. In practice, you wouldn't do a simple 50% like that, you'd, and you've probably got more than two states. So it gets a bit more complicated. But that's just to get the principle across. But... Often you have data that has categories. So for example, ages, nice and distinct ages, integers. Um, any, anything, anything that's categorical data. And the question is, what is the best type of noise to add to categorical data? How do you add the noise? And it turns out, those of you who remember any statistics, there's a distribution called the Laplace distribution, which I've got there courtesy of Wikipedia. Um, and the Laplace, that is an exponential curve. But it's an exponential curve that cuts off in the middle, basically. So it's, it's symmetrical. Um, and what this, this tells you how much you have to adjust your data by. So if you've got a value in this, say, 20 to 29 column, and say there are 10 people in the 20 to 29 column, you then apply this Laplace distribution centered on the 20 to 29 column, and pick your random number, and if it's beyond a certain threshold, depending on various other parameters I'll come to later, um, you would nudge it up to the 30 to 39. So you might take that 10 and reduce it to 9, or you might reduce it to 8, or you might increase it to 11 or to 12. And the amount you adjust it by is governed by this distribution. And it turns out that this is the ideal distribution to use because the, when we look at the mathematics that defines the differential privacy, it uses an exponential. Um, and th that exponential is exactly cancelled out by this exponential and the Laplace noise. So the two exponentials cancel themselves out. Um, so it is the perfect distribution for this type of data. Um, so another example. Slightly different, third-party aggregation. So I mentioned we can use third parties here that we trust. So I've got, a, in this case, I've got a, an entry in a configuration file which is somewhere between 1 and 100. It's an integer between 1 and 100. And it's meaningful to me to find out the average of that value across my user base. So I want to know what is the average value across my user base of this integer. So what I do is I have two independent, trusted third parties, which I have contracts with, and they are not going to talk to each other. So when I send some data to, the, to party A, and I send some data to party B, um, they are not going to share who sent what data where. So what I can do now is um, pick a random number between 1 and 100. So I can take a random number between 1 and 100, and take my original value, so let's say my original value was 45, and my random number is 10. If I take 45 and add 10 to it, I get 55. If I take 45 and subtract 10, I get 35. 
if I take the average of 35 and 55, I'm back at 45. So if I know 55 and 35, I also know 45. But if I only know 55, I know nothing. Because I've added a random number, which is an evenly distributed number in the range, um, you know, uh, 1, to nine, 1 to 100. Um, it's evenly distributed. And effectively, I've just shifted that distribution around by 10 places. Or uh, by 40, sorry, by 45 places. Um, so if I have only one number, I have no information. So what I do is I send the 55 to the first party and the 35 to the other party. And so the person who has got 55 now knows nothing about my original value. And the one who got 35 knows nothing about my original value. We do the same. All the users do the same thing. So the trusted third parties are now collecting data from lots of users. And they just add it all up and publish the sum. And when they all publish the sums, if you combine the two sums, all those random numbers will cancel out in the total. Because I have plus the random number minus the random number in every case. So they will all cancel out. And I will be left with the average across the whole user base. And so this is an example where, provided you trust the third parties, and there are companies, uh, you know, in the, people are doing this with SSL certificates and so on, where you've got independent companies acting as trusted third parties in the community. Um, and um, so they're starting to look at offering this sort of service. Um, <clears throat> so then we get on to a couple of terms. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit now. Um, privacy budget, which is looking at the maximum tolerance in the output for revealing information about the input, if you can get your head around that. So this is one of the terms you'll see. This is um, tracking the amount of privacy that you're leaking. So you basically give... So when we have that database question, and people are asking questions of the database, you give each person asking the questions a privacy budget. And every time they ask a query, that privacy budget goes down a bit. Um, and the lower the privacy budget, the more noise you end up having to add. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. uh, so again, you track it across multiple queries. Um, and, it, but you, and you also limit the number of contributions to the output from any individual input user. So this is going back to the when you're aggregating. Um, yeah, I'll skip on a little bit. Um, privacy loss with two parameters you often see in the literature, epsilon and delta. Um, epsilon is how much noise you're adding to the data. Um, so it's measuring the effect of one individual's information on the output. Um, and we come back to the things I've already explained earlier about what's the problem. If I've got my database with 99 and my database with 100, um, what's the probability that I'm going to get the same output from both of them? If they're both completely identical, it's useless. There has to be some difference, but it has to be below a particular threshold. And this is setting what that threshold must be. Um, and then we have sensitivity. And that's saying, what's the greatest effect that one individual's input can have on the output of the process? And that, again, determines how much noise. So we looked at three open source libraries, um, OpenDP, uh, one from Google, one from IBM. I'll skip past all the details, but we fairly easily settled on OpenDB. OpenDP has been the most sophisticated. Um, and so the idea is that we want to try and get that one into Fedora as the one that people should be using when they need to do anything with differential privacy. So it, it has all the algorithms in there these parameters I've just mentioned briefly. It knows how to do the calculations. There's an API. It's well documented. And it's linked back to the original literature. Um, so Fedora, some of you may remember last summer um, or autumn, fall, there was a push by the desktop developers to collect uh, telemetry data uh, to help them make decisions on desktop. Um, so we're putting forward some of these techniques as potential mechanisms to help them achieve those goals. Then we have a setup here 
how to uh, do that sort of thing using confidential telemetry. So when you send this data off, you can encrypt it, right? And what we've got here, if the pointer, well, if the pointer works, um, we're actually going to use two key pairs, and we, we encrypt it twice. People with Tor, Onion, routing may be familiar with this sort of idea. You encrypt it twice. Um, so you send all your data from the client here, rep data is represented by a Russian doll, to the encrypted twice, send it to the collector. The collector strips off the outer layer and gets the inner packet, but can't see any of the data. But it can strip off all the information about who sent, one, who sent what and when. So you're left just with the inner packets of data, and you don't know where they came from. You pass those on to the second uh, uh, container here, and the second container can get the, get the actual data out and process that data. But of course, it doesn't know now where, who sent what. And in principle, the administrators of those machines can't unless they collude. But if we put all this in what we call a confidential container, those keys could actually be in the TPM and never have left the private keys, could never have left the confidential containers. And you can put an attestation system around this and so forth. Um, and so you can publish the code that's running in the collector, prove that that code is running there. Um, and so in principle, that uh, confidential container doesn't have any shell access to it. There's no way an administrator can go in and pry at the data. Um, so that's what we're trying to set up. I've got a very quick demo, which I'm just going to play here, um, which is just showing um, basically what we've got, uh, got so far. Um, I think this is the last slide. And yep, that's going to be perfectly timed. Um, so this is prepared by uh, Pavel. Um, it emails on the uh, front slide. Playing faster than that. Yeah. So this starts up the two uh, components. So these are basically two containers. The collector, which we've just described. So this collector is accepting the data. Yeah, I'm just thinking. <laughs> well, he was going to be here, but unfortunately, unfortunately he's ill, so um, he sent this instead, but he would have talked it through instead. <clears throat> so this is what he would have said. <clears throat> yeah. I think it's too difficult to record a video with sound, I think. Yeah, well, he'll, he'll be watching. He'll be watching the video. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Prarit says he'll send you a video uh, <laughs> responding in a similar way. Yeah. So this starts the uh, collector, and then in the other tab, we start the processor. And then we send some data. Now, the data we chose to use for the demo is uptime and the list of Fedora packages that have been installed. Um, so there are some interesting characteristics about this. The uptime, that could be very precise and give away whose machine it was. So the uptimes have to be rounded by a very specific algorithm that chooses good sizes to round them to. So there are going to be enough similar answers. And you're not going to get unique answers uh, as a result of the rounding. Um, and one of the things with the package lists is the packet, the sizes of them, um, they're going to vary a lot. Um, so again, there could be information leaked from the package size. So you have to, again, pad it with a certain amount of random data up to a particular size. Um, I think this is just about finished. <clears throat> so I can 
should be able to see at the bottom. Where's my mouse? Well, 15 seconds. <clears throat> yeah, and then what he's actually doing then is shuffling column-wise, so shuffling the data up so you don't know what came from where. Thank you for watching. There we are. Right. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So I encourage you to um, go through the references on the slides. Um, the, the the top link is the link to the slides, but I'll upload them to the. Uh,